I'm not a historian, um, and I, my chapter looks at um, the influence of quantum mechanics on philosophy of science uh, from the logical empiricist um, onto um, Bell, but I'm only going to drill down into a specific thing today that I do cover in the chapter, but I've gone a little deeper into it, not nearly deep enough. Um, I want to uh, remind you of the thesis of Paul Foreman, uh, <coughs> this paper, Weimar Culture, Causality and Quantum Theory, 1918-1927, adaptation by German physicists and mathematicians to a hostile intellectual environment. Some of you may know that Paul Foreman was a student of Thomas Kuhn and trained in physics. Uh, he uh, interviewed a lot of quantum physicists for the American Institute of Physics. Um, and the thesis is essentially that cultural values uh, that are dominant in a pre given place and time, and it's just more than the zeitgeist, uh, can influence the results of science. Um, and in his case, it was the looking at what happened with German intellectuals as they saw the collapse of the Wilhelmine Empire in 1918, um, Oswald Spengler and people like this, and it, somehow in, in Foreman's mind, this made uh, the physicist and the mathematicians, even like Hermann Weyl, more conducive to quantum indeterminacy. Now, when I first read this, I was back in grad school and uh, about 10 years after it was written, and I thought it was a preposterous thesis. Uh, and as the older I've gotten, um, the more I realize it's not as preposterous as it once seemed. And so I'm going to try to do a little bit of a variation on it uh, today, uh, focusing on these characters, uh, Paul Feyerabend, the philosopher of science, the infamous philosopher of science, um, David Bohm, uh, here shown reading the Daily News on the day that the communist Chinese took Shanghai, or the day after, I should say, and Leon Rosenfeld, who was, of course, one of the close associates of Niels Bohr, and a great defender in his own very peculiar way uh, of the, what we could call the Copenhagen interpretation, although I don't think anybody but Rosenfeld had his own views about it. And in a little bit more uh, detail, um, I have to consider these characters. I see that Stalin has been included. I apologize for leaving out Louis de Broglie in a talk in Paris, but um, it actually Bohm came to his theory independently of de Broglie, at least that's what he tells us. So uh, I, left, uh, I could leave him out on those reasons. But essentially the, the narrative here is going to consider um, what happened in the immediate post-war period uh, with this man, uh, Jadanov, uh, who was um, essentially Stalin's successor to be. Um, he had been party secretary in Leningrad. Uh, he would actually uh, was the party commissar who ran the uh, Red Army attack on Finland, which was a disaster. Um, and he'd been re rehabilitated, and he became the cultural czar of um, the Cold War on the uh, side of uh, Stalin. And it's this campaign of Jadanov in 1946 and 1947 that uh, led two physicists, uh, Blokintsev and Terletsky, to um, write critical papers on the Copenhagen interpretation as bourgeois idealism. Bohm uh, says that he came to his, uh, his theory by reflecting on a paper by either Blokinski or Terletsky, although in English, and by conversations with Einstein in Princeton. Um, well, we'll see that identifying that paper in English has been a, a real task, and I have not succeeded in doing it. Uh, to introduce the rest of the characters, Paul Feyerabend started out as a very loyal disciple of Karl Popper and critical rationalism. Um, and changed very radically uh, after his encounter with uh, Leon Rosenfeld. In fact, with Rosenfeld's diatribes 
against Bohm's theory. Um, Bohm and Feyerabend were colleagues in Bristol in the 1950s, the mid-1950s to late 1950s. And um, it was Rosenfeld's diatribes against Bohm that lead us to Feyerabend and essentially to this rich garden of theoretical pluralism that Feyerabend will advocate for science uh, by the uh, end trajectory of his life in the famous book Against Method, which um, <coughs> has gone through four editions and translated into something like 33 languages. Um, this is one of the diatribes of Rosenfeld against uh, Bohm. It's from an early uh, paper in 1953. Um, and what it says here is the point of importance here is the necessity with which the concept of complementarity is imposed on us. Uh, we are not here in the presence of an idea which we can either accept or reject according to whether it conforms to this or that philosophical criteria. It concerns uniquely an adaptation of our ideas to an experimental new situation in the domain of atomic physics. This is entirely, it is entirely on the plane of experience that we can judge if its conceptions, its new conceptions, are adequately uh, serving their function. So entirely on the domain of experience that we judge the Copenhagen interpretation. Um, and Rosenfeld would go on to say that uh, there really is no alternative to Copenhagen in 1953 and in many later papers, and that will be what I'm going to be talking about. Um, here's Feyerabend's ultimate response to that kind of univocality of scientific messaging. Um, unanimity of opinion may be fitting for a rigid church, for the frightened or greedy victims of some ancient or modern myth, or for the weak and willing followers of some tyrant. Variety of opinion is necessary for objective knowledge. And a method that encourages variety is also the only method that is compatible with a humanitarian, humanitarian outlook. I want to suggest to you that these two quotations, one is the result of the other. Um, in fact, that pluralism of Feyerabend comes from essentially his response and horror at the dogmatism with which Rosenfeld was defending the Copenhagen interpretation in Rosenfeld's own version of the Copenhagen interpretation. So I'm going to start with uh, these details about Bohm from Alival's fantastic biography. Um, he joined the uh, Communist Party of the US while he was a grad student at Berkeley, a student of Robert Oppenheimer. Um, and he was an avid reader of Marx, Engels, and Lenin. His fellow grad student, Joe Weinberg, was interviewed some many years later who said that Bohm actually read Engels' Dialectics of Nature in the original German. Now, the original German text was only assembled in the 1930s from manuscripts that Engels left, and it had been immediately translated um, <coughs> by communist publications all over the world. Um, but um, Bohm read it in German as a graduate student, Dialectics of Nature. He became assistant professor at Princeton University in 1947. And this was the period of uh, the McCarthyite uh, um, paranoia in the United States. And he was called before the House on Un-American Activities Committee, headed by Joseph McCarthy. And he took the Fifth Amendment, that is the, the constitutional right in the United States not to testify against yourself. Um, in 1950, he was indicted for contempt of Congress, and thereafter, Princeton did not renew his contract. Uh, Princeton behaved, behaved very shamefully. Even John Wheeler, who was not in any way sympathetic to left-wing ideas, on the contrary, thought that Princeton had behaved in a very shameful way with regard to Bohr. Having some free time from being relieved of his duties at Princeton, Bohm had time to think. And in that time, he came up with his 
first version of his theory anyway, his hidden variable theory, which appeared in January, 1915, uh, January 15, 1952. Uh, here's the theory. Um, and it was written sometime again, according to Olival's biography, between the end of 1950 and June 1951. What's all this got to do with the uh, Ruskies and with dialectical materialism? Um, here's a letter of Bohm from October, December 1951 uh, in a collection of letters, a very interesting collection of letters uh, that was published in 2017 to um, a Berkeley graduate student that he'd known who became a mathematician and was the wife of a physicist. Um, and he reads, he says here to her, um, and he's writing here from um, Brazil, a clear, sharp, optimistic, materialistic point of view providing infinite possibilities of development and the possibility of growth of a common human purpose having objective existence within the human race as a developing thing would have far more appeal, particularly if it could be backed up or backed by some striking success in dealing with nature. It would be a powerful talking point to be able to say the old, tired, disorganized, defeatist, negativist, so-called positivist point of view failed, obviously because it closed our eyes to all the possibilities in nature at the atomic level. How much more do we expect it to do to the same at the human level? At both levels, progress is possible only if we adopt an optimistic, dialectic, for forward-looking point of view. Dialectical because it must take into account the infinite possibilities for development that flow out of the opposition of all the opposing elements in the universe. Any, even a beginner in discourse analysis could see that this is just paraphrasing Engels, dialectics of nature. And then he writes to Yevick again, uh, right after his theory has come out, why in 25 years didn't someone in the USSR find a materialist interpretation of quantum theory? So um, Bohm gives his own account of the origins of his theory. Um, Blokintsev and Terletsky made it clear that it is not necessary to adopt the interpretation of Bohr and Heisenberg and showed instead one may consistently regard the current quantum theory as an essentially statistical treatment. That was Blokintsev's ensemble interpretation, which would eventually be supplemented by a more detailed theory permitting a more nearly complete treatment of the behavior of an individual system. They did not, however, actually propose any specific theories or models for the treatment of the individual system. Then in 1951, partly as a result of the stimulus of discussions with Dr. Einstein, the author began to seek such a model, and indeed shortly thereafter, he found a simple, simple causal explanation of the quantum mechanics, which, as he later learned, had already been proposed by de Broglie in 1927. So the intellectual origins of Bohm's theory are either in, um, or, or both with discussions with Einstein and his dissatisfaction with quantum theory as a purely statistical theory, as he saw it, and in some paper by Blokintsev or Terletsky. We'll go to that. Um, this is now in the literature. Uh, in Max Yammer's book, uh, stimulated by his discussions with Einstein and influenced by an essay which, as he told the present author, was written in English and probably by Blokintsev or some other Russian theorist like Terletsky, and which criticized Bohm's, Bohr's approach Bohm began to study the possibility of introducing hidden variables. And then he notes that Bohm has forgotten the exact title and author of this paper. Um, Yammer continues uh, on a 70th uh, birthday festschrift for Bohm. After sending uh, Einstein his book, Quantum Theory, Einstein invited Bohm to discuss the matter in detail, these discussions and the accidental reading of an article written by Blokintsev or somebody else, we've lost Terletsky, were a turning point for Bohm. Jim Cushing, in his um, book on um, the development of hidden variable theories from de Broglie to Bohm, uh, in his, by his own recollection, Bohm was stimulated to rethink 
his um, conventional position on quantum theory when, in 1951, he read a paper by Blokintsev or Terlecki, critical of Bohr's approach. Now, that is in accord with what Bohm himself says in Causality and Chance in Modern Physics in 1957. Um, and then uh, Cushing adds, well, David Bohm confirmed this for me in an interview in London in July of uh, 1989. And then Oliver uh, continues the story. Later, Yama reiterated the story in a kind of festschrift for uh, Bohm's 70th birthday. Bohm did never contested it. This information, however, raised, as Yammer himself had noted, uh, Bohm had forgotten the exact title and author of this paper, and there was no paper either by Blokintsev or Terlecki published in English before Bohm's shift to the causal interpretation. And that I've uh, tried to verify. There's been no paper published in English prior to Bohm's theory. Um, I happened to work at Stanford, where the Hoover Institution is, which has one of the largest collections of documents of the US Communist Party. And I spent hours pouring through old communist paraphernalia, including the intellectual uh, uh, journals like Political Affairs, Science and Society, whatever they have. I have not found one paper by Blokintsev or Terlecki or an English summary translated from the Russian of, of this. So um, it's very curious. Um, but Bohm certainly learned about Blokinsky and Terlecki's um, objections to the Copenhagen interpretation and their condemnation of Copenhagen as bourgeois idealism. Indeed, the papers by the Soviets criticizing complementarity were first translated and published in French, not in English, and this in 1952 while Bohm's uh, shift to the causal interpretation occurred in 1951. Okay. So let's look a little bit at these gentlemen. Um, uh, <coughs> the more significant physicist was Blokintsev. He headed a large research institute at Dubna, uh, north of Moscow. And um, Terlecki here uh, <coughs> was uh, also a quantum physicist. And they were... Um, working in the period uh, when Zhadunov was thought to be the successor in waiting to Joseph Stalin, uh, and he was indeed the propagandist in chief of the Soviet Union from 1945 till his death in 1948. There's some speculation that he was murdered, although it's never been uh, documented um, definitely. Um, lots of speculation about his demise. Um, his son uh, married Stalin's daughter, uh, Svetlana. Uh, he was quite close to Stalin. Um, he got his own stamp. That's a big thing. And he created this uh, period called Jadanovshina, this period of ideological purification in the Soviet Union, uh, which started in 1946. It says that the world is divided into two camps, imperialistic and democratic. And the, um, co the only thing that the, um, the main principle of the Zhadunov doctrine was summarized by the phrase, the only conflict that is possible in Soviet culture is the conflict between the good and the best. I'm going to focus in on this speech that he gave to um, the conference of Soviet philosophical workers in Moscow on the 24th of June, 1947. And this speech has been, was translated into English in the uh, US Communist Party journal, Political Affairs, in 1948. Well, you could, don't have to read all of it. It's just in, in the red. Um, an example of Bolshevik struggle against the opponents of materialism is Lenin's book, Materialism and Imperial Criticism, in which every sentence is like a piercing sword annihilating an opponent. Um, the Kantian vagaries of modern bourgeois atomic physicists leads them to inferences about the electrons possessing, quote, free will, unquote, to attempts to describe matter as only a certain conjunction of waves and other devilish tricks. Here is a colossal field of activity for our philosophers. Um, well, 
And he ends this with a quote from uh, Engels uh, on Ludwig Feuerbach. Um, I'll call attention to this one other passage. Soviet philosophical publications are often scholastic and conciliatory rather than creative and militant. They stop short of developing Marxist doctrine further and in fighting against idealist perversion. Okay, so where were these idealist perversions in Russia? 10 minutes? Um, Moshe Markov, uh, a young physicist, wrote in this uh, journal uh, that had just started, uh, Problems of Philosophy, 1947, a discussion of the measurement, measurement problem in which the Copenhagen interpretation was presupposed. He does say that we can avoid subjective language in using the Copenhagen interpretation, and that should be done. But uh, he <coughs> the article was attacked by Terletsky, among others, uh, and it caused the editor of uh, the journal to be uh, to forced to resign. Leading the attack was this paper of uh, Terletsky, uh, where he said the Copenhagen interpretation is mockist in spirit. Now, code for that is that it's against Lenin's book, Materialism and Imperial Criticism. Uh, and he says that Marka simply followed bourgeois scientists in making complementarity the basis of quantum dynamics. Um, we don't have to spend time with that. That's the main paper, but that occurred after Bohm's theory appeared. Let's turn to Blokhintsev's book. First edition of his Principles of Quantum Mechanics came out in 1944. Uh, the second edition in 1949. The second edition now has a preface in which he says the idealistic conceptions of quantum mechanics, which are now widespread abroad, are subjected to criticism, um, blah, blah, blah. He got the Stalin Prize for his, the second edition of his Principles of Quantum Mechanics in 1950. Um, now we turn to Rosenfeld, uh, who was a uh, Marxist of his own stripe, but not a Stalinist. Um, and in this review in Nature uh, of Bohm's uh, 1957 book, uh, Causality and Chance, he writes and concludes, I'll just uh, briefly summarize here, um, it's a that such irrational dogmatists should hurl the very accusation of irrationality and dogmatism at the defenders of a common sense, uncommitted attitude of other scientists is the crowning paradox, which gives a touch of comedy to a controversy so distressingly pointless and untimely. And some years just after that, Feyerabend had had enough, and he wrote a belated review of uh, Bohm's 1957 book, where he compares the defenders of Copenhagen to the more dogmatic of the medieval scholars, the sole exception being the latter followed Aristotle, not Bohr. And uh, in that review from 1960 in the British Journal for Philosophy of Science, a belated review, three years after the book appeared, uh, we find many themes uh, that Feyerabend will subsequently develop and will essentially define his philosophical career, articulated for the first time. Um, I don't need to read these in the interest of time. There are quite a number of them. Um, we, alternatives, uh, even opposing concepts, what he called counterinduction, is preferred to theoretical monism. Um, we have to broaden empiricism uh, to allow for uh, experimental results that are, might be even incommensurable. And uh, this is the origin, actually, of the work that Feyerabend did on Galileo and the Tower, which is so famous in Against Method, where he essentially argues that Galileo only succeeded against the scholastics because he used rhetorical means. Uh, the data actually supported Galileo no more than they did. In fact, the data supported the scholastics, the observable data. And there's a nasty footnote that he contra is contra to Rosenfeld here, um, and I won't uh, linger on that. So that is the story that I have to tell. Um, and uh, I think that you can tra trace this trajectory of Feyerabend's career and the enormous influence it had on the uh, 
uh, development of what we now call theoretical, methodological, um, all kinds of different pluralism, pluralisms in philosophy of science, which have come about like uh, you know mushrooms after a rain, uh, following uh, against method. Now, um, I, I said I carry my story into the 21st century. Why is that? Because you now find things like this. If you, as you live in the Bay Area, as I do, you sometimes take walks in Berkeley and you see this in nearly every front yard. Signs like this. Now you can agree or disagree with uh, many things on this uh, this yard sign, um, but science is real. What do we make of that? What does that mean? It means, and of course, it means trust the experts. As a public, you know admonition, it means trust the experts. And what does that lead to? That leads to statements like this letter to Lancet uh, in the uh, early period of COVID, March 7th, 2020, uh, where the uh, first discussions were, were of what was the origin of the COVID virus. Was it possibly a leak from a lab in Wuhan? And some 20 different virologists, people of significance in the scientific community were orchestrated to write this one letter to Lancet. And among other things, it says this, the rapid, open, and transparent sharing of data on this outbreak is now being threatened by rumors and misinformation around its origin. So I think we need Fire Robin's attitude more than ever in philosophy of science. Thank you.